think the word creative was mentioned on my report card for the entirety of my time there. So two years ago when James asked me to speak at Creative Mornings, I was very shocked. And two years later when he's asked me to come back, I'm even more shocked. Shocked was one thing, but then completely confused about the topic that he asked me to speak about was the next thing. So this morning's topic, yes, context. I actually genuinely had to Google it. <laughs> I had no idea what was going on. I was like, what on earth am I going to speak about? What's context? What do I speak about to the creative community in a talk like this? And I started reading it. The circumstances that form a setting for an event, statement, or idea. And in terms of which it can be fully understood. And now it's even more confusing. And I went slower. <laughs> And then I went faster. And I started to think about it and how it fits into everything that we do as the brands that I'm taking care about and everything that you guys can do. And that's what I'm going to speak about this morning. Before I do that, I think it's important you understand from my side a little bit of my context. The most important thing to me is that I'm the son of these two people, my mother and father. And I'm the husband of this beautiful lady. That's the number one priority of my life. I literally don't care about anything else. That's the top tier. The second tier, for right or for wrong, and a lot of people will argue, because the first part of my life, I spent playing rugby, getting hit very hard, often, in the head, all over my body which is not very smart. I don't suggest anyone who hasn't started playing rugby starts playing rugby now. I've since stopped. When I stopped playing, I moved to extreme adventures and challenges. In 2015, I ran across the Sahara Desert. In 2016, with Colin, I ran across another desert. And I started to think, actually, what I've become is something of an extreme athlete. I only do things that are a little bit extreme. And it's what my wife tells me all the time, you're too extreme. But that's okay, that's part of my personality. To that end, I've now taken on a new challenge to cycle next year in 2018 in four ultra races across four continents. And I'll share a little bit more about that after. The second tier of my life is about my health, how I challenge myself, and therefore, as a byproduct, how I take care of my body. Without my family, I don't have anything. Without my body, I also don't have anything. The third tier of my life is kind of what makes it all happen. It's my work. I'm an entrepreneur as well. In 2008, I started the brand Inner Fight. I wouldn't say it was a mistake, but it just kind of happened. And in 2015, with my wife, we started another brand, a food brand, Smith Street Paleo. I realized that through, why I share this with you, because this is really my values and my decision making process. Through taking care of what's important, through taking care of your body and how it moves, you can then start to take care of all these other cool things which you make your business and you make your life. I don't need a show of hands, but I imagine people see people start to think, Whose priority goes from here backwards? Who puts in their calendar first thing during the week, the business meetings, then maybe what sport they're going to do, then finally how much time they're going to start playing with their loved ones. Much to my wife's detriment, she has a color code in my diary, and she's in there first thing. So that's a little bit about how all of this comes together. Before I started my businesses, I used to work for this company. I spent about five years there. And I was in an incredible environment in 2005. I was very, very lucky. I started Adidas as, they called me junior sales executive. I, I didn't deserve that title at all. I was way, 
way lower. Um, but on one day, I got a chance to go to a tour. I was in a room in a hotel in Dubai somewhere, a big hotel. There was about 5,000 people there. And there was a guy on the stage. And I just looked at him and I thought, what he's doing, he has passion, he has energy, and he absolutely loves it. And I said to myself, do I have passion? Do I have energy? Do I absolutely love what I'm doing? And I'd only, I was 25, 26 years old, and I'd only been in Adidas for a year, and it was the opportunity of a lifetime. Work for one of the biggest sports brands in the world. You can do anything. Just work hard. You'll go up the ladder. You'll climb the ladder. You'll climb the ladder. I said to myself, I'm going to be that guy. That's the guy I want to be. I want to be a guy that lives with passion and purpose and meaning. And I'm going to work super hard. And every single day, I'm going to wake up and I'm going to work really hard that one day I can do what I want. A few years later, quite a bit of hard work later, we opened this place. 5,000 square foot gym. The concept, the name, everything from scratch, put together. There's a caveat to that. Most of the ideas that you see on that screen, not mine. Most of what happens in there are ideas from other people. What we do is we bring them to life. I think we sit a lot scratching our heads, trying to figure out exactly what we should do. I think if we listen more to people and then action the good stuff of what everyone says, we can start to build something. When we moved in, these pillars were not red. I'd done something stupid. I painted them gray and it was dull. It was, everything was different. So it's quite a big transition. What happens though when you have a new business or a new idea? Different thoughts start to come through the mind. Or two. How do I how do I really do this? I've got such a good idea, but I just have no idea how to bring it to the market or how to make it happen. And everyone tells us. Like I was told at school, when I got that bad report, no, it wasn't that, yeah, it wasn't. No creativity yet. My mom was always like, you need to be creative. Stop kicking the football against the wall. You need to do something different. So we're constantly challenged with this need to be creative and to do something different. But all the time, most of the time, no budget. I'm going to do this, no budget. We can build this! And times are actually really hard. I don't know what's going to happen in this economic, geography, political, and I don't care actually. But we're in a tough time. And in a lot of scenarios, there is no budget. And when I started my first company, there was also no budget. Because every time I spent something, this hand went in here, and my lip balm probably almost came out most of the time. <laughs> there was not much else going on. So, you had to be creative, and we had to start playing with things. But there's always this pressure, it's time to sell. We work on a new project, we work on it, we put in hours, we put in hours, we put in hours, and nothing starts to come back. We're not selling anything. So then we're in a rush. And traditionally, this is what we do. We try and sell by shouting at people, you will buy it, it's the best, this is the greatest for you. And I thought, oh God, this guy, we're talking at people. And it's awful. Imagine if my whole talk was like that. It's disgusting, isn't it? And we never listen. We never ask people. What's going on? I've got this idea, what do you think 
Because whenever we do that, we're always ready to say, no, 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 it's not like that. We're looking for reassurance rather than looking to listen. And it's just downright rude. And that's why a lot of startups come with good ideas, creative beyond my wildest dreams, but in the end, they shout at people, talk at people, they don't listen, and so their potential customer just thinks they're damn right rude. And they walk away. So we looked at things a little bit differently and said, how should we sell? I thought value was number one. And that's why I thought it was important to share with you guys what my values are and how I go about things in that order at the start. I said to myself, if I can communicate value to my potential audience, and then they can potentially see value, they'll come. Value was always number one. Selling is creating messages. And no matter what you do, no matter how creative you are, at the end of the day, if you don't sell, and I know I came from a sales background in Adidas and I shared that with you, but if you don't sell, or if someone doesn't sell for you, there is no money. And it's not sustainable. So we have to sell through messages. We have to create different messages that we then deliver to people that people are then going to see value in. And we do this on a various number of different platforms, which you guys are all super familiar with. We're going to run through it. And that is the context. I do now know a little bit what the word means. We're now jump into it. What we do is we sell fitness. My company, this one, sells fitness. You come in. There's a little cash counter here. You pay us some money. You jump onto the dance floor. We do these ones. It's about an hour. You end up lying on the floor. You feel like you're never going to come back again. Then you come back again, and in six months, you look pretty good. <laughs> right? We sell fitness. That's our product. And when we started out selling fitness, I was like, how do we get it out there? What platform, what context can we use? <clears throat> and old school, of course, 2008, there were still newspapers. I think there still are newspapers. Um, but it was expensive. Back then in Dubai, there weren't 50,000 fitness companies. There was only a few of us. And so all of the fitness media wanted us to advertise with them. One guy here in the check shirt, particularly. <laughs> and he wanted to charge me 5,000 US dollars for half a page. And I was like, what? I don't have budget, I don't have anything. I'm a startup, I'm new. It's too expensive. Plus, people read your magazine and dispose of it. Or leave it by the toilet and that's as good as disposing of. And I had a website. I was already 2020 ready. I wanted everything to be clickable. I wanted people to be able to connect. That $5,000 to advertise in the best newspaper, probably more in that one, in the best magazine, it just wasn't clickable. It didn't work. It was completely the wrong platform, completely the wrong context. This, actually this, this guy, he wasn't alive yet. I don't think this guy was. But I was like, somehow we've got to, we've got to keep it digital. And those that work in the digital space, this is old news for you, but we'll go through it anyway. I put easy when I started, but because of the, I'm sure there's some people, it's easy-ish. Right now, we can take a photo in here of what we're doing. If we're a business account on Instagram, we can put it up there. We can promote it to a specific population that likes to go and do whatever. And they're that age, and they're that. We can be really targeted with what we're doing. So it is kind of easy. On a base level, it's the easiest entry. And I haven't spent much but time yet. The second thing, we can be super reactive. We're proactive by putting the content out there. But we can be very reactive. The old days were great, weren't they? When there was only Facebook and everyone's attention was on there, you could have real good battles with people. Just not abuse the hell out of them. It still happens, but not quite as good as it used to. Yeah? So we can be very reactive. We can be reactive positively as well, though. We can deal with customers' questions straight away. We can't do that in a newspaper or a magazine. We'll read that magazine, and then we start to think. 
and those thoughts stay in the head. Whereas someone can reply to an Instagram, a tweet, Facebook, and we can react straight away. And I like that. I thought that was a really good benefit because I could get closer to my customers and I could get that value across to them straight away. It was somehow economical. Actually, it was free. Before Zuckerberg did what he did and everything's paid for and you're only going the feed because the algorithm of blah, 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 it was quite cool because it was just free. You chucked it out there. Things have changed a little bit, but I think you should pay a little bit. It was direct as well. I could put it in the hand of people. We could get it to people. And what I could do, not only about the content that we're creating, but we could create a conversation. People were starting to create content. People were starting to get these messages but still shouting a little bit with them. What I thought through these platforms is that we can start to have this conversation. And we can start to persuade people. When you start, you think everyone's gonna jump on your platform or on your website. And if you're super lucky, you'll have a line outside. Like when email were releasing properties in 2007, there was a line this long, people were camping, and it was just a mess. We're not all email, and it's not 2007 anymore. conversation that we're able to create through these platforms for us, and it's different, was really what made it a difference. So what did we do? We started a podcast. Inspired a little bit by James. It was eight years ago when we first had a radio show, and I was like, this is so easy. This guy has a full-time job. He's doing this, that, and the other. This radio stuff's easy. I can talk about fitness the whole day long. And so that's what we did. We're now almost at 400 podcasts. That was number 300. What we're able to do is start, this is one context. We're eight, not everyone do, who, who uses podcasts. 30% yeah. Yeah, of the room. I've chosen a platform that only hits 30% of the room. Of those that listen to podcasts, how many spend more than one hour a week listening to them? Keep your hand up for two hours. Keep your hand up for three hours. That's not too bad. 10% of the room listen for more than three hours. You've got their attention. You can communicate what you do, the value. I think, and we can discuss it afterwards, the reason why our fitness show has gone for so long and not been pulled by the powers that be is that we rarely mention, he mentions this more than I do. All we talk about is fitness. And what that does is it creates people's interest to start a conversation with us, and the conversation is the king. We've done the radio show for eight years. I can count on two hands the number of leads and actual conversions I've got from that radio show, but the value monetary-wise of those is something quite impressive. Through that conversation, in that particular context of podcast, be it radio, you start to create a conversation with people that can then see your value. That was one tool that we used, and it's quite a lot of fun. And you play with it, and sometimes we interview different people, sometimes we make short shows, sometimes we make long shows, sometimes we make really bad shows, and that's what happens. But when you've got three or four hundred, it's all good, because there's one or two good ones. Another thing we started doing was creating outdoor events. This was a recent one. This guy here was our guide. Go with him, it takes a long time, but it's very good fun. We took all of these people, about 30 or 40 people, and we've done this on numerous occasions. Well, remember what we sell? We sell fitness, burpees. Not often, but sometimes, startups. This kind of stuff. One of the contexts that we use, we take people out. Why do we take people to the mountains in Ras al-Khaimah on a Saturday on their weekend, to do a hike that takes 12 and a half hours. Because it proves to them their training has been very worthwhile. When they started, their self-belief was probably down. They've now completed, this is actually super steep, this bit. And in other parts, it was about as wide as my foot to go up and down there. That teaches you quite a lot. We're a fitness company that sells fitness. The context that we're using here is taking 30, 40 people outdoors to help them understand 
the value in what we're delivering that they're coming into four or five days a week. So something very different. We turn the gym into a nightclub. This was not my idea either. Someone said to me, this is an absolute true story, as they all are, don't lie, <laughs> on top of the Someone wrote me an email and said, I love all of the people that I go to the gym with, and actually, I love nightclubs. I just don't really like the alcohol and what it does to people. Can you create the same environment in your gym? <laughs> oh. Yes, okay, let me have a think about it. So I called Red Bull and I said, what about this? Have you ever created a nightclub style? Because we know Red Bull, it's synonymous with alcohol, parties, this kind of stuff. Now they've moved more into extreme sports, That's, or they've always been a lot in extreme sports, but I think the amount that's consumed in extreme sports compared to bars and nightclubs, anyway, that's not my problem. <laughs> and they said, yeah. And they bring this truck, the Red Bull truck, into the gym. Completely free event for all of the members who had about 100 people. Started at 8.30 at night and went to about 10.30, 11 o'clock at night. Some people drank too much Red Bull. <laughs> no one was hung over the next day, they told me. And they have an experience that's equally as good, if not better, because they're getting a natural release of endorphins, of dopamine, through this nightclub in a gym. Completely crazy platform, completely different context to what you think, but suddenly we create some engagement. And of course, when you try to partner with big brands like Red Bull, it kind of goes quite big quite quick. The guys in Europe want to know why we're doing it, what's going on, what was it like, what was the format, how can we replicate it, can we make it bigger, is this something that we can continue to do? Not my idea, someone wrote me an email, I thought it was crazy, I was like, let's make it happen. So again, something that was very, very different. This guy rocked up in 2013. He was 197 kilos. He sat on like two of these chairs. It was like a couch, and filled, he would have filled them both. He was like a really, really big dude. And such a nice guy, full of life, and Tommy wanted to change his life. I've never seen anything like him before. I was like, wow. This is something quite incredible. Conversation got going, and he made it quite apparent quite quickly that he really didn't have enough budget to pay for our services. And I looked at him and I thought, I can't let this guy go. If I let him go, he's 26 years old, if I let him go, before 30, we go to his funeral, for sure. It's, it's, he's a massive problem. And I turned around to him and I said, leave it with me, I'm going to figure something out. And I called him 24 hours later, I said, you start training today. He said, I'll take care of all of your training, I'll give him a personal trainer three times a week, we'll see how it goes with the nutrition help, I'll sit down with him once a week. This incredible amount of time that we gave to him and that we are giving to people and that you give to people, that, I mean, that's the biggest commodity. And that was the only expense. So the only expense I've got is time. I said, you're gonna do two things. The first thing you're gonna do is everything we say. And it's not negotiable. If we say sleep at seven, you sleep at seven. If we say drink broccoli, you drink broccoli. If we say do, you do. He said, I'll do it. I said, the second thing you're gonna do is you're gonna promise me, not only you, but we can use your story to help others. What do you mean? I said, I'm going to make sure you lose 100 kilos, and then we're going to inspire everyone within your community. Two years later, that's when you have to be nice to the media. And this is born. Arabic word, intisar, which means victory. I apologize if it's a little bit spelled right. I always get in trouble when I'm using an Arabic word that's not quite got the right bits for that. <laughs> we set up a foundation on the back of his success and his hard work and my promise to him and his promise to me called Intisar, 
which helps underprivileged Emiratis participate in sport and fitness. He's the ambassador for it. We help a school in Ajman that has 3,000 underprivileged Emiratis that come from broken homes, orphans, abandoned on the street. Ajman's about one hour and 15 from here, for anyone that doesn't know, it's very close, it's part of the UAE. When I went to see them, they had two basketballs, and I said to the head of PE, I said, what's going on? He said, yeah, it's good. We have two. So they don't have to fight over one. So we supply them with a lot of different sports equipment so that these kids can also enjoy sport, and we actually train a lot of Emirati kids at our gym for free. Completely different context. It's cost me time. It's cost us and some of our members have generously donated to, to the foundation. But it's given us and it gives us some value to the wider community that's something which I believe is truly unique. Guaranteed, now, 2017, this guy, if he had carried on, he might not be with us. So not only save his life, but we save well, a lot more. This guy. <laughs> I want to share, he's here, but I would share the story if he wasn't here. Three years ago, I said to my assistant, make an advert for Dubizzle for a photographer. She said, what for? I said, I want to hire a full-time photographer. You're crazy. Said, what are you talking about? Think back to what I said before. The content that we create is key. But the conversation is the king. We didn't have the content. I thought if we hire a photographer, we capture absolutely everything, we're going to play online, we're going to give all of our members all of these cool pictures of them going, Aah! and they're going to post them, we're going to win. And it started to happen. This guy showed up, actually for his job, true story, and I think I told him before, three people applied. And I was, I was devastated. We're a gym, it's cool, it's something. Because no one put these two together. Like, why should a gym have a photographer and videographer? Two of them, the CVs were terrible. And then one day, day this guy showed up. I had a look around, didn't, he didn't say much. He was sort of looking at me and I'm looking at him. He said, I'm here for the job. Pardon? I'm here for the photographer job. Come for the job. I was literally blown away. In an age where email, CV, bang, da da da, this guy had travelled. He was sweating. It was the middle of summer. I don't. He'd been in Dubai like a week. We we're in Alcos. It's hard to get to. It's easy, but it's hard. He'd come from where he was staying in Dira to apply for the job. And I was like, wow, that's something. That's someone who really wants to do something. And since then, he's worked tirelessly for the last three years to create good pictures and good content that we can use to communicate on various platforms. That we can use to create these stories. Every single one of those pictures that you've seen that I've shared, he took. Most of the videos that we make, he shoots. Everything that we create to help people to communicate on their various platforms about what they're doing within our community we produce in-house. So it's not about you don't have budget. It's not about you don't have a good idea. It's about thinking about the different platforms. It's about listening to the different opinions you're going to get and the different people that are going to give those opinions. Be careful when you ask for opinions. Because some people will come back and I told you that. You have to be a bit careful. You have to listen in a nice way. And then actioning what they do. So let's go back to it. Context. The circumstances that form the setting for an event, statement, or idea. And in terms of which it can be fully understood. I want to ask you three questions. And I want you to go away and think about them. 
First is what statement are you making? What's your first slide that I shared with you? It doesn't have to be the same way mine is, but what is it? Because that's what statement you're making, because that's going to come through in everything you do. Secondly, and you might need bits of lots of paper, what ideas do you have? And thirdly, and probably most challengingly, how are you being fully understood? Let me show you a quick video. The goal is super clear to be the first person to complete four ultra cycling races under the Vikingman brand in one year, a thousand kilometers each race on four different continents. A goal like this takes inspiration and support for me and my wife and my mum and dad, they provide both of those. Also to partner with the most unique water brand in the world, Volvic, is something absolutely awesome. Ultra races are like the wildest theme park ride you've ever been on. At one moment you're at one with the most beautiful nature, and then in the next minute you're having the worst nightmare ever. It's just insane. It's going to be a great year. That's me. That's the statement that I'm going to make in 2018. Hopefully it helps some people within our community and wider to do what they're going to do. Thank you so much for listening. Hopefully you've got something from my talk. And if you want to ask me any questions, talk now. Communicate on any platform, anytime, online, no newspapers. Thank you so much. Yeah.